Good morning, Twin City Bible Church. My name is Katie Berger, and I am your host this morning. We are so glad to have you all here in person and online. Um, as we get started this morning, I wanted to direct your attention to the, our, our online bulletin, where you can find our order of service, our readings, uh, the song words. Um, and I wanted to make a note here in the sanctuary, we are preparing to have lots of people in here uh, within a couple minutes. It's been uh, it's super fun to have really full Sundays. So if everybody can scoot towards the middle in whatever section you're in so that newcomers can, uh, who come in in the next few minutes can easily find seats, that would be a gift to anyone walking in in the next few minutes. And with that, we will transition from all of the things. I don't know if anyone else got caught in the triathlon traffic on the way here. I did. I was a little earlier to be ready for this morning. But um, there are all the distractions and steps and things it takes to get ourselves to church. But here we are. And we do a call to worship at the beginning of the service to change our attention and redirect from where we've been, from all the factors influencing um, our day and where our minds are, and to settle ourselves intentionally into the presence of God. So we're going to read together from Psalm 98. So if all of you who are able can stand, and we're going to go ahead and read and let our attention settle towards Jesus. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in sight of the nations. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre with the lyre and the sound of melody, with the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Join us in musical worship this morning. Praise the Lord, his mercy is born. Stronger than darkness, many his mercy is my love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, do every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy 
mercy is born. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is born. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good Good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for him. Far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are. Who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I can hardly speak. as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are It's who I am, it's who I am, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, to us, you're a good, good father. Are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by.
are you? It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. God, thank you for your church. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ that we get the opportunity to spend this time with. Pray that your spirit would be leading Pastor Brian as he's preaching this morning and open our hearts to hear the message. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Take this time to say hello to your neighbors now. Good morning. Hello, TCBC. My name is Katie Berger. I'm a member here at Twin City Bible Church. And again, I just want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. We are so glad to have you here in person and online. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, If you are in pews, if you're able to scoot towards the middle so newcomers can get seats on the edges as they come in, that would be great. So take a moment. Sometimes we call this the TCBC shuffle to make a little room on the edges for anyone who's still making their way into service. Um, Here at TCBC, our mission is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world. And there are a lot of ways you'll see that while you're here at Twin City Bible Church. One of them this year is that we are all together um, seeking to be transformed by Christ as we read through the Bible together. And we're calling this our read-along. There are three plans people are doing. Some are doing a top 100 passages reading. Some are doing New Testament. That's what I'm doing. And some are doing the entire Bible in a year. And I just thought today that is one of the things that stands out to me as part of what makes this church a community I love being part of, the um, rigor with which we study and pay attention to the scriptures and let them inform our lives. Um, And for me, I've been going through, I'm a few days behind, I bet a lot of us are, and that's that's working okay because the New Testament is short enough to catch up and, you know, certain uh, one-day readings of catch up. But it has been a gift to see Jesus just day by day um, doing what he's doing, out living out, bringing the gospel, initiating the kingdom through the book of Matthew, and I'm excited to keep going. So um, if that mission of campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world, if that um, 
specific thing we're doing this year with the Bible reading. If any of this sounds exciting to you and you're a newcomer here, we would love to share more about our church with you after service. Um, We have a little welcome gift for any newcomers. These are It's obviously a water bottle, Um, and there's a little welcome station behind the sound booth out in the lobby, so if you want to stop by there after service, please grab a water bottle and um, give us a chance to meet you more. Um, Additionally, if you are a newcomer or if you're a returner, we are going to take a moment and fill out our connection card. So our connection card is a chance for um, the church to know more about who's been here and to share, not spam, not a lot, but a little more information about what we have going on week to week. Um, So take a moment, and I'll do it too, and we'll all fill out our connection card. All right. Well, I mistakenly, or perhaps wisely, delegated mine to my six-year-old, so my name is currently being spelled to get on a card over there. (laughs) Um, I want to share a couple of ways we can all get involved with things going on in the church in the next few weeks. Um, The first is our rental property Q&A. So that is next Tuesday here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. Many of you wouldn't know this. I knew it and had forgotten. We own two rental properties as a church here on Michigan Avenue street, Michigan, whatever it is. Um, And we've held those for a long time and our leadership council has been discerning what the future of those buildings should be. And the recommendation from a subcommittee has been to consider selling them. And so now it's time to take that conversation to the congregation. So if you want to talk about that, ask questions, understand the past or where we're going with that, come Tuesday night for a chance to talk and interact about the rental properties. The next way we can all get involved, and truly this is an all play, is the Children's Ministry Volunteer Training. That is today. It's lunch right after the service. You don't have to RSVP, have RSVP'd already to come. Um, If you serve with Children's Ministry uh, regularly, please head down. And if you're like, oh, that's something I kind of like, or I'd like a way to do another step of serving here in the church, or I've always liked interacting with kids, head down and just check it out. The lunch will be good, and the information will help you discern further. And we can always use more children's ministry volunteers to invest in our kids, to help them grow in Jesus, and to help them have an experience of the Lord while they're here at church. The next way uh, those of us who are suited to it can get involved is through our Christmas play audition. So some of you hear that and think, this is not me, but some are like, yes, I would love to be part of that. Our auditions are today at 2 o'clock here, I believe, in the sanctuary, yep, and there will be a a portion that's pre-prepared that you come in ready to do and a cold read, I believe it is called. So if you're interested in that, please come and try out for that. Um, The last thing I have to share is our Next Steps Lunch, which is next Sunday, September 29th, following the service downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. And the Next Steps Lunch is um, really that. It is, we used to have just a newcomer's lunch. Now we're calling it Next Steps Lunch because sometimes you've been around a while and you're like, but I want to know how to go deeper. I would like to um, understand the next steps in my walk of faith or my involvement in this church or a way to serve. So if that sounds like you and you're like, yes, I would like to connect with the staff and have a chance to know what my next steps might be, please join us next Sunday for the Next Steps Lunch. And with that, I will invite Maggie Courtright. Good morning, Twin City Bible Church. My name is Maggie Courtright, and um, I'm a member of the leadership team here at Twin City Bible Church. And um, this year I'm serving on the nomination committee nominating committee. And so um, this announcement has to do with your participation in that event. Um, As a church body, it's time for us to consider who will be serving um, as leaders in the coming year. And um, the nominating committee is responsible for providing candidates for our three major um, leadership bodies. We have the stewardship team, we have the um, shepherding team, and then the leadership council. And for the next month, we're asking for you to give your input in the form of nominees for any or all of these committees or bodies. Um, The stewardship team makes recommendations 
regarding finances, building property, and um, also helps us to grow in our, in our understanding of stewardship and generosity. The shepherding team is responsible for spiritual and emotional support for the flock, including one-on-one -on -one discipleship, encouragement, conflict resolution, and mentoring. The shepherds are the ones who pray with us here on Sunday morning, and they pray for us throughout the week. The Leadership Council is the, is the governing body of uh, Twin City Bible Church. Um, and we are tasked with developing the vision for the church, sort of big picture items um, going forward. Um, the Leadership Council is responsible for administrative or oversight and policy development. In December, we as a congregation will be asked to approve the nominees for the Leadership Council. According to our Constitution, the Leadership Council will then in turn vote upon the nominees for the shepherding team and for the stewardship team. For the next month, the nominating committee is asking for nominations for each or any of these leadership bodies. As you prayerfully consider this process and as the Lord brings people to mind, you can submit your recommendations through a link provided in the, on the TCBC website or through the At Home with TCBC. Um, you can also talk to any member of the nominating committee, and those members are myself, um, Terry Thies, um, Neiman Coleman, Leanne Galloway, or Vor Lori Van Wingerden. And Pastor Brian is also a member of this committee. Uh, our deadline for nominations from the um, congregation is um, October 17th. We're asking you please join us in praying for this whole process. The scripture gives us so many guidelines for selecting who will lead us, suggesting the importance of these decisions and the health and the growth of, of Christ's body here. And we want to be faithful stewards in discerning who God is calling to serve in each of these ministries in the coming year. So please pray f with us and for us. And um, if you have a candidate, um, please nominate. Um, we're going to ask Steve Ross to come forward, and he's going to pray for us right now. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Steve Ross, and I am a member of TCBC's shepherding team. Um, the Holy Spirit. Uh, during our corporate prayer together this morning, I'll be uh, inviting you into some times of, of uh, silent prayer, so I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Jesus, Messiah, we praise you as the source of living water, just as you offered the Samaritan woman at the well a font of water springing up to eternal life, so you extend that offer to us this morning. Just as at the temple in Jerusalem, you offered streams of living water, indeed the Holy Spirit, to all who believe in you, so here in this sanctuary in Urbana this morning, you extend the same offer. We praise you that just as water refreshes us, so your spirit refreshes our spirits, watering the growth of the fruits of your spirit in our lives. The prophet Isaiah tells us that you are the one who pours water on a thirsty land and streams on dry ground, and you pour out your spirit on your offspring, your blessing on your descendants. Hear now our silent prayers and praises for your blessings on us. Holy Spirit, we confess that even as we have come near to you this morning with our mouths that speak the correct words and our lips that honor you, yet our hearts are far from you. Our weekly worship is our custom, driven by habit, but often empty of meaning. In our pride, we reverse roles. We turn things upside down. We are the clay, and you are our maker, our potter, yet we regard you 
as the clay and you as without understanding. In our pride, we think that we know better. So we live our lives as we please, disregarding your commandments, loving only ourselves, loving money, boastful, ungrateful, unforgiving, without self-control, conceited, lovers of sexual immorality rather than lovers of God. But we know that though our sins are many, yet your mercy is more. So hear our individual silent confessions of our sin. Holy Spirit, with Zach Osinski, we give thanks for the graduate music Bible study on the campus. Thank you for its new leader. Bless those involved to be salt and light in the school of music. We thank you that we worship here today freely and openly this morning, where others of our brothers and sisters in Christ must meet in secret. So let us use that freedom to be salt and light to our community. Now hear our own silent prayers of thanksgiving. Hear our petitions, Holy Spirit. We ask for direction and peace for Matt Dopsch as he navigates his employer's move of his job with the Caterpillar Company to Peoria. Guide him in his decision to find a new role locally or to look outside the company. Comfort him as he mourns the loss of a much-loved job. We continue to pray for safety for Ralph Brubaker's son, Riley, stationed on an aircraft carrier in the Middle East. That is our prayer, safety and protection for all members of our armed forces. We pray for saving faith for roommates and family members and coworkers and neighbors. Bless the spread of the gospel to those yet to believe. We pray for David and Ruth Crabiel, working with the International Students Incorporated Organization for the past 40 years. We thank you for Ruth's outreach to international women, many from Muslim backgrounds. We thank you for the giveaway of household items that she recently organized at TCBC. May some of those women return to her weekly meetings to learn more about you. And thank you for David's three weekly Bible studies. We pray that you would bless both the in-person local meeting and the Zoom meetings that reach around the world. We also ask your blessing for the recent marriage of their son, James, to Annalisa. Holy Spirit, hear now our own silent petitions. As we turn now to hear your words to us in today's sermon, we thank you for the spiritual gifts which you have given to Pastor Brian. May his words be the channel through which you deliver blessing to us, living water. And may we be moved, like the Samaritan woman, to leave our usual routines, go back to our towns, and tell elders about Jesus. Amen. The children are now dismissed for their time. And Pastor Brian. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. My name is Brian Scott. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad you joined us on a rainy, triathlon-filled Sunday morning. Um, I was thinking about those on the doing the, the, the swimming part of the triathlon. It's today, don't even dry off, just go. Um, we are in our series called The Holy One. We are studying the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, together, we're in Isaiah chapter 29 this morning. If you have a pew Bible, I believe that's on page 341 for the regular print. 
And if you have a large print, that's page 657. Isaiah 29, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 24. And while you are turning, I will uh, bring us to the Lord in prayer over the text and our time together in the Word. Father, thank you for your Word, which is light to us. It is a sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to penetrate our heart, our soul, um, and to even identify our motives. Lord, I pray that our the state of our week, the state of our minds right now, the state of our life right now, Lord, would all come under the power and the um, anointing of your word to change us, to make us more like you, to give us hope in hopelessness and despair, and to heal brokenness. Lord, we ultimately invite you, Holy Spirit, to be with us, to be on the process of us reading your word and be in our hearts to transform us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 29, 13 through 24. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Is it, it is not yet a very little while until Lebanon, is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest in that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender." And lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. And with an empty plea, turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed. No more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the, whole, of, God, of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. This is God's Word. Have you ever questioned your faith? And what I mean by questioning it is its reality, its validity, or its relevance to the rest of your life, to the day-to-day -day humdrum of life. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian novelist of a century and a half ago, who grew up in the church, the Orthodox Church, and in his early 50s, had this existential crisis after he had written most of his famous works, including War and Peace, the, one of the longest novels translated into English. He had this crisis of wondering the meaning of his life. And he reflects in his confessions about his childhood and the irrelevance of the faith which he, which he received. You see, he was reflecting, he starts off in his confessions, and he says he never really believed seriously the faith that he was given. 
He just blindly followed, casually followed the instruction of the elders. And he remembers this point. In, at high school, a boy came and announced the discovery that in school, there really is no God. It was all just an invention. And, and he recalls feeling, this is exciting news. But even as his faith has, had waned and declined and he was reflecting further on its relevance to his life, here's what he says in his confessions, his confession. He says this, perhaps you'll relate. The decline of my faith occurred in the way in which it has always happened and still happens among those from our kind of background. It seems to me that in the majority of instances, it happens like this. People live as everyone lives, but on the basis of principles that not only have nothing in common with religious doctrines, but are on the whole contrary to them. Religious doctrine plays no part in life or in relations between people. Neither are we confronted with it in our personal lives. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying religion is effectively irrelevant. Faith is irrelevant. The reason why people lose faith is because it has no bearing on real life. You could say this, religion in which his heart, well, in religion in which he experienced, which he experienced, was one where his heart was distant from God. If you've ever felt that, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever questioned your faith, this text is for you. The title of the message today is The Holy One's Promise to the Disconnected. The Holy One's Promise to the Disconnected. So, as we'll see in the text here, we need to understand, number one, the disconnected heart. What is it? And then secondly, ways we sever that connection. How does it become disconnected? Thirdly, the promised reconnection. The disconnected heart weighs we sever the connection, the promised reconnection. As we've been looking uh, at the prophet Isaiah, we've really been highlighting this attribute of God that he, in a, in a unique way, experiences the holiness of God. It, it shapes his whole ministry. It shapes the language of the text. We see a reference to the Holy One of Israel, that phrase, or a derivative, the Holy One of Jacob, 26 times in this book, whereas it only occurs six other times in all the rest of the Old Testament. Isaiah had this encounter in the presence of God, and he saw the holiness of God, and he realized his need to be atoned for because of his own sinful ways. And that transformed his life and his ministry and is impacting us here today. So let's look at the first point, this disconnected heart. Isaiah's ministry and his initial calling, his initial con co uh, commission, excuse me, was to a people whose heart condition is summarized in this text, and it's actually in verse 13. Verse 13 says, and the Lord said, because... This people draw near to, with, a, with their mouth and honor me with their lips with their, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. It's a summary of the heart condition of 8th century Judah and Israel, and, and sub, subsequently centuries since then and even into the present for many. And notice, well, we didn't read, I mean, we read it earlier, but I didn't just read verse 14. There is a, in verse 13, because, and in verse 14, a therefore. We'll get to the therefore, but let's look at the because. And in fact, let's look closely at the text. Look at the, the sort of descriptions of the people. I mean, on the one level, on the surface level, these are actually very positive attributes. People who draw near, the phrase draw near, secondly, honor me. Thirdly, fear of me. If you were to extract those three phrases, those are actually the things that we should do. All believing people, all faithful people should draw near to God. They should honor God. They should fear God. In fact, we've talked about it last week. The fear of God we talked about is the thing we need to overcome all other fears. 
So what's the problem? The problem is all of this was just lip service. The problem is it was all, I could say the right things, but I don't really mean it. The problem was there was a heart disconnect. It was insincere worship. It was going through the motions. So as it says in the middle sort of that verse, verse 13, while their hearts are far from me. On the surface, they're doing all the things. They're sacrificing all the sacrifices. They're showing up at all the feasts. They're praying all the prayers. They're being present in all the assemblies. But their heart didn't really mean it. It was like Tolstoy. It had no relevance to everyday life. What does the heart disconnect look like? There's many examples. If you were to just broad categorize it, you could say it's dead religion or false religion, in other words, other religions, or fake religion, or just any type of religious duty, service, performance, participation that lacks real power or true relationship. A disconnected heart is, is given to us, if you're familiar with the very famous parable, we often refer to it as the prodigal son, but really it's a parable of two sons found in Luke's gospel in chapter 15. And in that particular parable, the one son is a wayward son, and he goes off, and he takes the inheritance, and he treats his father as if he were dead, and he goes and he squanders it all on want and living, the text says. It says that he comes to his senses, and he wants to sort of regain this dishonoring uh, relationship with his father, and he goes and he says, I will basically beg to be brought back into the house as a servant, one not living present, but one who will sort of work his way back into good graces. Yet the older son, who does all the right things, who never leaves home, who never squanders anything, who doesn't go off in wanton living, he's the one who's the most distant in heart. He's the one when the, old, the, the, the son who came home was being celebrated was saying, I will never come inside to celebrate him. Look at what all I have done, but you never honored me, and yet you honor him. You see, we often think of the irreligious, the atheist, if you will, the secular, as examples of those whose hearts are disconnected from God. And while that is true, the parable of the two sons in this text remind us that the religious are just as guilty and perhaps more deceived about how far their hearts are from the living God. In the first century, the time where the uh, New Testament is written, and in the New Testament, the Gospels and the, the writings about the ministry of our Lord Jesus... Jesus confronts the religious elite of his day. And in fact, he quotes Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, in Matthew's gospel in, verse, in chapter 15, where he talks about how Isaiah was right. You do all this stuff, and it means nothing. In fact, he was critiquing the religion because they cared more about the outward expression of rule keeping than they did for the people they were demanding to keep the rules. In other words, they had no mercy. They only wanted judgment. They only wanted people to do all the right things on the outside, but their hearts themselves were distant from God. This is what a disconnected heart looks like, a heart disconnect. Presently, what it might look like for you is this. You might say, my faith has no bearing on my work, on my studies. I go to church. I'm in church for a few minutes out of the week, and then I go back and I do my thing. It's like I'm living in two worlds. I think about those... It, in politics, we're in that season, but those that would say, 
you know, my faith really has no bearing on what I do. And in the context of when that is said, usually they're trying to appeal to people across a broad spectrum. But if you really think about what they're saying, you're wondering, well, what does? What? And, and beyond politics, for all of us, what is the thing that determines what you do? What is driving how you view your work? What is driving how you relate to your family? How you deal with your studies? What your aspirations are, your goals are? What is the thing that drives that? Now, I do want to offer one caveat. Because we could say, you know, this, this reality of a heart that's distant from God, of a religion that is without power or relationship, could be true of both a nom- newly nominal Christian or one who has walked with God for a significant time. Yet I want a caveat because perhaps you're in a season of your life where you could say, you know, I just don't feel it. I don't know if I feel it. And, and you could incur uh, an unnecessary amount of condemnation. And I want to caution us from being overly subjective about this because Scripture never really says that your feelings dictate either the validity or the vitality of your faith. Never really says that. And in fact, Scripture even curbs our over-reliance on our own knowledge of God as an indicator that we have received a salvation because it often reverses the knowledge relationship direction by saying, you are known by God. That's how you know. In other words, it's not just that you know God, it's that He knows you. And though I could feel one day I'm here or the next day that I'm here, His knowledge of me never changes. So my feelings could change, but my status doesn't. My knowledge could change, but my status doesn't. And I want to caution us to not take this too far. But we do need to wrestle with where our hearts are. How does the Lord respond to this condition? So, in verse 13, we see the condition, the heart condition, but how does He respond? Now, I, I, I want to remind us, I mean, we're not doing a Bible study. We are preaching through Isaiah. There are 66 chapters. We could be here for a while. I've chosen to not go that route because many of you will graduate before we ever finished. But I want to acknowledge we've skipped a major section of the book. So starting in chapters 13 and going forward, there's this major section where God is issuing forth judgment of all the various nations in in the Middle East, the, the region of the known world, if you will. And in fact, earlier in this particular chapter, God has he's promised Judah, hey, I'm going to judge you. In fact, he says, I'm going to seize, siege you. I'm going, to, I'm going to surround you. And he's talking about the judgment to come. And, and in one sense, there's this localized reality where Assyria is going to come and seize Jerusalem. Pastor John will preach about that next week. And then there's this a sort of more distant reality where Babylon is going to come. Assyria doesn't conquer Judah. It does wipe out the northern kingdom. But then Babylon's going to come and wipe them out. And God's saying, yeah, that was me. That's me. When you see this happen, it's me and it's judgment because of all of your distant religion, all of your waywardness, all of your idolatry. I've warned you for years and years. I told you before you would come into the promised land this would happen. So judgment has come. But now he says in verse 14, Behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. With wonder upon wonder, the wisdom of their wise shall, men shall perish and the discernment of the discerning men will be hidden. In other words, God's promising salvation. So you think about what we just laid down as a foundation here, understanding these are people whose hearts are far from God. Maybe, and you, you might admit, yeah, that's me. I feel that disconnect. I feel like I'm just sort of going through motions here. There's good news for you. God promises after judgment there's salvation. There's something powerful. Wonders. I'm going to do wonderful things again. What is he talking about? Well, the wonderful things God has done is he, he took his people who were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, and through his mighty hand, he delivered them. 
through the plagues. He gripped the heart of Pharaoh, who already hardened his own heart. The Lord hardened it further so he could show his miraculous power and deliver his people. Not one was lost. They crossed the Red Sea. He provided for them in the wilderness, manna and quail, every single day. These are the wonders. And there's a more immediate trajectory of these wonders that the Lord speaks of. Yes, I am going to judge you. You're going to be taken into exile, but I will bring you back. That's salvation. And yet, when we look in a moment at the description of what that salvation means, clearly the return of exile is not the fulfillment in its fullness. It's only when Jesus comes and ultimately when he returns, we receive it. Judgment first, then, sal then salvation. Okay, how do we get the salvation? How do we get the, how do, how do we see these wonders? How does this change our heart? How does this transform us? Well, before we get to that, we have to look at the second point. How do we sever the connection? The ways that we sever it. You see, in verse 4, 15, we get this effectively a woe, and then in 16, he's describing that in a little further detail. Verse 15 says, All, uh, Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are dark, are in the dark, and who say, Who sees us? Who knows us? He's saying, You sever the connection when you make plans that depend on you. When you functionally act as if God is not there. And in the original context here, Probably the plan is because they know Assyria's coming, we need help, Let, let's go talk to Egypt. Let's go, and don't tell the Lord, let's go get Egypt on board with us so we'll be protected. Now, it doesn't explicitly say that here, but if you, turn, if you just looked at chapter 30, that's where the Lord goes. Woe to those who trust in Egypt instead of trusting in me. It's making plans. It's like if you make plans and if you're not really cognizant spiritually or mentally that the Lord is there, you're not really counting on him. It'd be like on the playing field if a quarterback calls a huddle, but he doesn't invite a wide receiver. Clearly the play's not going to him, right? I'm not counting on you to get us the first down. We do that with the Lord when we don't include him in our plans. But he further illuminates this, verse 16. You turn things upside down. He's talking about the condition of the heart, the one that's far removed from him, that could say all the right things, but the heart is far away. He says three things here in verse 16. Shall the potter be regarded as clay? That's number one. Secondly, the thing that made say of its maker, he didn't make me. Thirdly, or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. Now, they all say the same thing, but they all actually are saying something slightly different. The thing that they're all saying is, you're distorting the distinction between the creator and the created. You see, the scripture gives us a very clear boundary. There is God in three persons who has lived for all of eternity, he who created all things, who himself is uncreated, and there is us. We are finite, fallible, in need of help. God needs no help. We are malleable, we are clay. He is potter, he is immutable, he never changes. And yet, in distancing our hearts from him, we flip it. We turn it all upside down. How does that work? Well, regarding the potter as clay, what does that mean? What is the property of clay? You, you, you know, remember those projects in elementary school and you go and you make a funny, va you know, thing for mom and then you stick it in the urn and it pops out and it's like, oh, thank you. That's funny. Well, I've always wanted one of those. Clay is malleable. We flip it and we make God to be the one that's malleable. How does that work? Well, it works a few ways. Here's one. How about when you read Scripture and you find something or you hear Scripture, you hear something talked about in Scripture, and 
yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't think I like that. Maybe, maybe okay, that probably doesn't apply anymore. Um, let's make it, let, you know, let's make it say this, or let's think of it in this way. What are you doing? You're bending God's will to fit yours. You're making him change to fit you as the one who doesn't change. Your disconnect, your disconnect from your heart, heart, it says effectively this. You say, God, I'm yours. I surrender to you. But what you're really saying is under the condition that you support my happiness. Do you see that? Do you see the disconnect? That's not really, okay, I'm not really for you, God. It's just only in this condition. Remember, I'm the center. You change to fit me. Secondly, the thing says of its maker, he didn't make me. How does that play out? Well, rather than saying God is sovereign over me, that's what the potter is. He's sovereign over the clay. And rather than saying I belong to him, because the clay certainly belongs to, proprietarily speaking, the, the one who makes it, forms it. Instead of saying God is sovereign over me and I belong to him, you believe or act, at least, as if you belong to yourself and you're sovereign over yourself. You sever the connection of heart. Lord, I worship you, but I want to call my own shots. I want to dictate how it goes, what my career path looks like, what my life will look like, how my relationships will go. And then this final piece. The thing form says of him who formed it, he has no understanding. In other words, you might think, maybe you don't articulate these words, but you might think, God just does not understand my life. He doesn't get it. It's, my life's so complicated. It's too, he clearly can't help me. So therefore, I'm on my own. Do you see that? Do you see the distancing? you see how we flip it, turn it upside down? You sever the heart connection from God when we make him out to be the clay and us to be the potter. And in the process, you lose true worship. You could say all the right things, but your heart's not there. Now, what's common to all of these aspects, all of these, these, these things from 15 and 16? You, you know, you have hidden plans. You think God can't see them. You make God to be malleable. You worship, um, you know, him only on the condition he supports your happiness. You think he doesn't make me. He didn't make me. I'm sovereign over my life. You say he has no understanding. And no, he can't counsel or shepherd me. I'm on my own. What's common about all these things? The common denominator is this. As it pertains to your heart, the person sitting on the throne of your heart is you. That's what's common. And, and therefore, what you've done is you've dethroned God, the Holy One, the one who, who is rightfully there, should sit on the throne, does not sit there. And so we could say this, woe is, woe to you who dethrone the Holy One and put yourself on the throne of your own heart. Let's think about the promised reconnection. And as we think about that, I want to offer, so here's just sort of like a case study of two examples of one, a heart that need, needs more transforming and needed more transforming and one that truly is transformed because that's what we're talking about. Th this promised reconnection is, is talking about a religion or a faith that actually sees power, transform your life. You're not the same. You are a new creation. Now, the first, this is a case study. So the first, these are real people, by the way. Um, the first is a well-known, infamous pastor at this point. Um, and lots of things have been reported about him. And anyways, in, in this sort of fallout of the church that he had built, which was one of the largest and fastest growing at the time, and he had a well-known persona, he talks about, he talked about how before he was a Christian, he was a street fighter, and he would win all the fights. But what's interesting is that when he became a pastor, he was still winning all the fights. He said all the right things. I mean, well, he said a lot of right things. 
there are lots of actual lives transformed through his ministry. But deep in his heart, something didn't get changed. The same desire for power, it, it never got checked. It never got, it never got, the gospel never got there. It remained dark, hidden. Conversely, if you've ever heard of the figure George Mueller, he lived in the 19th century, born in uh, Germany and ended up doing an orphanage in England. And before he became a Christian, he was a swindler. He, he, would, he would trick you out of your money if you knew him. He would, he would give you a great story, oh, I, you know, and then take it. And, but he was all, all the time robbing Peter to pay Paul. In other words, he owed this guy money. I'm taking it from you. I'm going to go pay him back and just keep that going. Until he finally met Jesus. Jesus radically changed his life. And if you're familiar with George Mueller, if you've ever studied, you know, missionary work and that sort of thing, not only was he an owner of an orphanage and did he start this orphanage as you saw the plight of children on the streets um, in 19th century England, he effectively made a vow. He never asked anyone for money. He only asked God. Now, I've raised money before, and you look at that. Now, is that a, should we all do that? No. He wasn't doing that as a, everyone, but he did it because, hey, I used to swindle people. I'm not doing that anymore. I've met Jesus. I can just ask God. He'll provide. It's, it's a powerful story. But do you see the heart change? Do you see the transformation? Do you see the difference between the two? Okay, here's the promise. The promise is, first of all, it's just, just in light of all that's happening in the Middle East now, it, it, this is very strangely relevant text. Verse 17, is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? Now, this is a physical representation of the spiritual transformation that God's talking about. What he's saying is, effectively, listen, effectively, in sort of dumbing it down, if you will, for my sake, not yours, um, that I could take a field, there's no life going on there, and make it into a forest. And if, as, as, as I could do that, I could take a heart that is far from me, that says all the right things, and turn it into a fire, one on fire for me. Turn it into one who truly honors, truly knows me, truly reveres me. That's what he's saying. See, this is hope if you have a lag in your faith, if you feel complacent or apathetic or feeling stuck. But here's the things that he says, and I'm just going to read through them quickly. This is the promised salvation, verse 18. The deaf will hear, the blind will see, verse 19. The meek will have joy, the poor will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Verse 20. The ruthless, there's going to be justice. Finally, the people in power who keep abusing their power are going to come to nothing. The scoffer will cease. All who watch to do evil will be cut off. Those who, who pervert justice, even in the legal sense, those who go to the gate where matters are discerned and they try to pervert justice by making the righteous person out to be the guilty person and the guilty person out to be the righteous person, I'm wiping it all out. And furthermore, Jacob, we use the phrase, you know, so-and-so is probably rolling over in his grave. Well, Isaiah is like, Jacob's probably rolling over in his grave thinking about where you guys are right now. But one day, because he's, you know, no more be ashamed, verse 22, no more fa uh, face grows pale. He's going to see his children, the work of my hands, the Lord says, and they will sanctify me. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel even those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. That's the promise. That's the promise for you. Now, how does that promise happen? What, how does this happen? How does God take a heart that's so distant and transform it into one that's so present with him? 
Well, as I said before, we're talking about Jesus, what he came to do. You see, as the passage, if we read the whole tech, uh, the whole chapter 29, judgment first, then salvation. Judgment first, then salvation. The Son of God comes and he is judged for your wayward heart and mine so that salvation could come to you. The, 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 the judgment for the people in the text was first exile, then return. The judgment for Jesus, he became an exile of heaven, living here on earth. And he has a greater judgment in that their judgment was, well, you're taken away from your land. And though Jesus heart was never far from his father, but always had the father sitting on the throne of his heart. On the cross, he was taken away and he was judged. He was forsaken so that you could receive salvation. And in, 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 as you study it, as you study the wonder of what the gospel is, as you know, come to know the wonder of who Jesus is, you become one who, as Isaiah promises, will sanctify the Holy One, will sanctify His name, will stand in awe of the Lord. So I conclude, do you feel disconnected from God? Do you feel like your faith has no bearing on other parts of your life? Do you feel like you're going through the motions? I encourage you to examine your heart because this could be an indication you've dethroned the Holy One. But I encourage you because there is hope in His salvation and what Jesus did to take your judgment so that you could be invited either for the first time or for the hundred thousandth time as a believer back to his nearness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the goodness of who you are, that you are creator of all things, possessor of all things, that we are the clay in your hands. I pray, Father, in ways in our lives that we resist your shaping and molding and moving and changing of us. Help us where we respond by wanting to just mold you to fit our own needs or desires. Lord, let us truly surrender to the goodness and the beauty of the salvation you offer us in Jesus. Whether we are not a believer or whether we have been one, Lord, would you continue to transform our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I leave you with a reflection question. How might you bring the disconnectedness or dis discontentment of your heart to the Holy One? You can respond to the word of God today through prayer, 
through reflection and through bringing our tithes and offerings to the Lord. So in a moment, we're going to have the plates passed. And there's an opportunity to give any tithes and offerings and also to put a yellow card, the yellow card in, if you filled that out earlier. Um, in terms of opportunities for prayer, you can check out our connection site um, to see many ways we pray throughout the weeks. But on Sundays after service, we have two of our shepherds who care for our, the spiritual needs of our congregation up front here to pray. So if you have a joy or a totally normal small thing or big thing going on, they are up here to pray with you um, and would delight to pray with you over those things. Um, we will go ahead and invite the ushers to collect our offering. Thank you. Oh 
lights shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And keep you, make his face shine. upon you and a thousand generations your family your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going Rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. Appreciate what you guys do. Uh, I'm going to leave us with a bened uh, benediction, uh, which this song actually is a benediction, but I'm going to share a different one. 
from Revelation. And the throne came, and from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. May you go in his praises as you go this week. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace and have a great week.